actually mirror the cycle. Uh, the firms connected to weak banks actually had stronger capex during the peak, and then it's a one-way uh, street uh, once the cycle turns down. Uh, I won't get into the interest coverage ratios. So, you know, one can, of course, formalize this difference of difference into an econometric specification. So on the, uh, the variables that we tried to explain were employment growth, sales growth, and capital expenditures. We tried to explain them by bank health, firm health, uh, and then bank health and firm health pre and post when the cycle turned. And we just used a narrative definition of the cycle that, okay, this turned around 2012. My sense is if you eyeballed some graphs or looked at some quantitative criterion for the cycle, some of them will give you 11 as the turning point, some other variables might give you 2012 as the turning point. Now, I'm not going to show you results of uh, these uh, specifications, but uh, the reason why this kind of econometric specifications are interesting and useful to do is because they help you do some counterfactual exercise. So the kind of exercise we are going to do is the following, which is, first of all, try and check if the bank health dummy helps explain the corporate finance of the firms in the pre and the post phases. So is the health of the bank, if one could interpret this specification causally, leading to a real sector outcome that is negative? So is this beta prime uh, coefficient less than zero? And if it is, then you can do the following counterfactual exercise, which is suppose the firms that are connected to public sector banks or firms that are connected to weak banks, say with high NPAs, Suppose I could one fine day wake up and switch all of these relationships to healthier banks. Then this beta prime is going to tell me what would be the restoration of real activity that I could get if I could do this switch. Okay, now there might be many reasons why one may think this is not a reasonable counterfactual exercise that we cannot wake up one day and transfer all these relationships for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I think it's an interesting thought exercise because, of course, what you want to think about is not that I'm switching the relationship, but if one fine day you could make this bank healthier by doing some surgical exercise, then what would be the restoration of real activity that you would get as a result of this? So, you know, one can uh, write down this counterfactual calculation uh, and uh, in a way it's, 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 it, it's getting a a little bit at, you know, the kind of exercises, uh, you know, monetary economists do for output gap kind of calculations, like they don't work with models like this, but what one is trying to get at here is, is an output gap, which is there is some real sector outcome that's not happening simply because you have unhealthy banks uh, in your economy. If you could switch these to healthy banks, then where would your output be? And therefore, this beta prime coefficient is actually telling you how much of an output gap estimate do you have that's attributable to the lack of health in your banking sector. And that's the sort of exercise we are trying to do. So when we do that on uh, employment, sales, and capex, we find the following, which is that the actual change from 2011 to 14, which of course, encapsulates the weakness that is imparted by the unhealthy banks in the system uh, is 6.3% on employment. So that's the uh, loss of jobs. Uh, sorry, the six point, yeah, that's the loss of jobs. Then uh, sales decline is 38.1% and CapEx decline is 34.8%. Uh, if you looked at the weak bank beta prime coefficient, that would imply that 5.5% on top of this could have been restored if you fix the health of banks. 7.5% of sales could have been restored by fixing the health of banks. And 7.8% of the capex could have been restored by fixing the health of banks. So in some sense, the sum of the two is where you could have been in terms of your overall numbers. And two is the output gap that is coming about because of health of banks. Uh, and you can see that this is a very large contribution in terms of employment. It's about 46% of employment contraction based on these estimates. In terms of sales and capex, it's a bit on lower side. It's on the order of 15 to 20%. But the way to interpret these numbers is that the banking channel using this sort of an 
uh, estimation could have contributed to between 20 to 50 percent of your real activity contraction. That's the way I've inter interpreted these numbers. Uh, you can even convert these into years of output that one lost. So you could look at annual growth in your employment and other numbers and think about how much of real activity got lost in terms of years of investment lost, years of employment lost, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think these are on the order that I have found in other countries. So I've studied the European sovereign debt crisis and the, un, the lack of having healthy banks since 2011, almost same time as our cycle. Uh, and I find very similar numbers uh, for uh, Italy and Spain when I've done this analysis. I had slightly better data there to tease out the bank lending channel than the one I'm uh, employing for India. So uh, in some sense, uh, uh, the results provide a strong case for cleanup of the bank balance sheets, but at the same time while resolving the corporate stress itself. It says that just fixing firms is not going to really take you all the way, but just recapitalizing banks is also not going to take you all the way because there is actually indebtedness in the underlying corporations themselves. Uh, let me skip this. Now, when I finish the study, I've, as I said, I've not even put it out in public domain because I think it leaves a lot of important questions unanswered. Uh, for example, I, I'm not actually using any quantity data of lending here at all. I don't know whether the healthy firms of these weak banks, were they really credit constrained? Because that's the channel through which the health of a bank should be affecting the firm, that the bank is not lending even to the healthy firms that are out there. But I don't have quantity data uh, publicly to do this analysis. Uh, did stress banks that uh, some of them did actually improve their capitalization and provisioning over the last year? Uh, is there any pickup in real activity coming to the healthy firms connected to the weak banks that have taken some measures or where the government has taken some measures to recapitalize and improve the health of these banks? Uh, usually a very typical part of this bust cycle, the reason why they become very protracted, uh, in my opinion, is because whatever free balance sheet capacity weak banks have, they use it to extend even further credit to their weakest firms. Because one way that you don't recognize an asset as having problem is that you keep lending to it over and over again so that you effectively extend the maturity of when the debt is to be paid back to you. Uh, it's called evergreening. It, ha it has happened in previous cycles in Japan, uh, to some extent in the savings and loans uh, crisis in the United States. Uh, my research shows it ha happened in Spain and Italy in the uh, sovereign debt cycle that they are trying to get out of at the present moment and so on. Uh, so, you know, is, is the credit, if at all there is a credit crunch to healthy firms, is it because banks can't lend at all? Or even what they could have lent, they actually misdirected and sent it actually to the wrong firms. Um, uh, did banks and firms that did restructure experience better outcomes? Uh, did stress banks have poor transmission? Monetary policy was actually quite accommodative during 15 and 16. Uh, did it get transmitted? Did it get transmitted to the wrong firms? Did it just facilitate extension of further credit uh, to the weak uh, firms of the economy rather than actually going to the healthier firms in the stress sectors? Um, you know, post-demonetization, some of these banks ended up with excess liquidity. How has that affected their uh, lending outcomes and so on? So could we have done this better? I have no doubt that we could have done this better. But what I would need to do this is a whole layer of different uh, data granularity to do this. So one would need a bank to firm loan level match data with loan terms at time of origination and corporate finance data at each of these points as well. Uh, one would ideally need a credit registry to get at this, uh, something that we might uh, want to invest in. Uh, I think it might even be a public good, so we could even have a public credit registry potentially. Uh, maybe it should not just be banks, it should be all creditors, perhaps even trade creditors and uh, non-bank creditors uh, out there. Uh, so, you know, 
one small step we have taken in this direction is that uh, RBI did start putting together for the largest borrowers such a bank uh, firm loan level database. Uh, and uh, we have just created a research group inside that will now integrate all of this with the CMIE data, with the banking data to see at least for the large borrowers if this study can be done better. Uh, I would need loan level ratings data. What was the quality of the loan at the time that it was made? It could be bank-based evaluation that might be biased, so some external evaluation might help as well. Uh, as the resolution efforts are uh, likely to go on floor uh, in a few weeks, it would be very interesting to keep track of how the restructuring that is taking place is actually improving the real sector outcomes for these firms. Uh, one thing we could do is perhaps even create a platform for secondary loan sales. Right now, loans that get sold by banks to non-bank finance companies, uh, one common complaint is that we really don't understand the corporate finance of these companies. So how do I purchase this loan at a price that the bank thinks it's right because they know a lot more about the firm than we do. Uh, so, you know, we could provide some transparency on this front. Uh, an interesting example here, during Southeast Asian crisis, when Korea resolved its crisis, uh, they had a publicly funded asset management company, but the main function that it performed was to actually create a completely transparent platform about corporate finance of the stressed companies, and that created a market for loan sales. And to date, that's the platform through which loan sales trade in the secondary market in Korea. So, you know, we could facilitate some electronic platforms like this. Uh, and, you know, right now, uh, we don't do a great level of uh, risk-based provisioning along the way. Uh, if we had firm level credit rating, default, and recovery outcome at sectoral level, we could gradually start switching to risk-based provisioning uh, for our banks uh, over time. Now, can this be done? Uh, I think it can be done. Uh, here's an example of what this parallel ecosystem that I was talking about at the uh, early part of my talk looks like in the United States. So to do this kind of research in the United States is now almost uh, bread and butter. And I think it has happened only, I would say, probably since 1991. Uh, so there's a data set called DealScan. Uh, which is a syndicated loan origination database. Interestingly, it's not mandatory that banks actually provide data here. Banks created this uh, data set mainly to help each other get a sense of at what spread is a loan being made to a given rated company, say, in the steel sector. And they wanted to know what other banks are doing so that they could price their loans accordingly. Uh, so that's run by Thomson Reuters. Uh, Federal Reserve, of course, has a much richer data set of this. It's called the Shared National Credit Program. So something like RBI's Krillic could eventually evolve to that, but it would have to be at the level of an individual loan facility so that origination, drawdowns, et cetera, can also be tracked over time. There are other data sets that also help you understand drawdowns of loans by companies. Uh, then uh, standard stuff on banks can be obtained through FDIC call reports. Uh, SNL Financial actually codes every single uh, balance sheet in the way the balance sheet is reported, and so you can massage it uh, the way you like. Uh, I would love to have things like this uh, for Indian corporations. Maybe CMI Pravis uh, is, a, is, is, is kind of doing that. Uh, you would need to, you know, in many of these studies, when firms are restructuring, they get sold in parts or wholly. So you have to keep track of the M&A activity, mergers and acquisitions activity. So in U.S., you would use a deal logic database to keep track of that. Uh, the secondary loan sales prices and who's now the current owner of a loan is 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 provided through the LSTA platform. Uh, uh, and then there are uh, rating agencies have put out data sets that actually help you assess default and recovery in default or loss given defaults uh, at individual firm and sectoral level based on a 40 year history of defaults taking place in the United States. Now, you know, you might want to do similar studies on mortgages, housing finance is picking up in India in a big way. Uh, you know, ideally, you could run something parallel happening for housing finance as another sort of parallel 
uh, ecosystem of uh, data sets and analytics that are being done on base of that. Uh, so uh, let me just say a few words on who could be key players. I think large banks, large non-bank finance companies, microfinance institutions could be very big players, I think, in providing us this data. They could, in fact, standardize uh, some of the data collection themselves. Uh, you know, every time a loan is made, uh, they could standardize what are the fields that we need to put together into a spreadsheet. Uh, and then RBI or, uh, or another policy institution could just play an aggregating role where, you know, we take that standard and we just be the recipients of these data that could automatically come from banks every time a loan is originated. Uh, and then, you know, either banks could uh, disseminate this through a data vendor or RBI could run a portal through which this data could be uh, disseminated. Uh, people could then massage and scrub this data to generate interesting analytics that could be sold out there. I'm sure researchers who are here could use some of this data. Uh, but more interestingly, I think our banks and other entities going back could actually use this data to improve their own credit decisions uh, uh, over a period of time. So I think, let me sum up, I've probably taken up uh, too much time. Uh, uh, I, 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 that I, I think we need, we need a lot of innovation, I think, on what we are counting. I think we need to count better uh, things that uh, really count. Uh, but of course, maybe it is the case that not everything uh, that we can count uh, really counts in the end. Uh, but things that really count, we are not counting as well. But rather than leave it at that thought, I would say maybe we should really push the envelope and think about counting those things better. So. Uh, that's all I had to say. I, 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 I do think that we are at the cusp of, I think, doing something big on this front, and I'm hoping that researchers, uh, students, uh, banks, um, uh, other financial entities who make money through finance and commerce, uh, and perhaps a whole set of firms that can really provide high quality information analysis, IT platforms, uh, data management, et cetera, can see this as a fertile ground and actually do business and make the entire system better off by doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Viral. That was really fascinating. And now I'm going to ask uh, Chetan Ghate, Professor Ghate, who's from the ISI and also, as was pointed out, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. Jaden, you want to go there? Yeah. Okay. There will be a chance to ask questions, so hang on and hold on to your questions. Uh, thanks very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, this conference is always very exciting, um, and uh, um, I couldn't, you know, agree more with what Viral said about, you know, working with uh, Indian data and the quality improvements required. Um, I've done a little bit of work on the Indian growth turnaround and. And one of the baffling issues there was that the, uh, if you looked at the sum of the states, it didn't add up to the national numbers. And that was always a difficult starting point to do empirical work using states as a unit of analysis. But I think things have progressed. And I think interest in Indian macro has also increased, although I think it's primarily more of, of, of an India-centered academic group rather than, there's a lot of interest in, in emerging market macro by international researchers, but I think the contribution in Indian macro is at the moment coming primarily from from Indian macro researchers, and hopefully that will change. Hopefully more international researchers will start working on Indian macro issues. Okay, so having said that, uh, I'm gonna confine my, my comments to, uh, to the slides that were given to me and to Viral's uh, presentation. So um, the starting kind of point is that, and this is kind of a, a new take in the literature as well, is that, um, that business cycles are financial, right? They're increasingly financial. And, and, and not entirely real, right? Um, so you see this in a lot of international data uh, that you see credit, uh, uh, bank credit. Uh, in the Indian case, actually, the interesting uh, expansion in credit is also from the NBFC side. Uh, but uh, you see, you see uh, credit and real cycles highly correlated, both in Indian and, and, and the international data. And the paper's basically trying to ask, um, 
what's the core movement in India's financial cycle, it appears to be strong, and I'll make some suggestions about how, how this could be, could be seen in, in other ways. Um, but there are also some other things which the authors may want to look at, uh, which is looking at the amplitude of the Indian credit cycle, possibly the frequency, um, and, and maybe trying to establish um, a little more that, that there are probably other drivers uh, of the credit cycle uh, than the real cycle, such as uh, policy issues like financial liberalization and competition. So those are things that may be influencing the impact of the real cycle on the credit cycle. Um, I'll also say that, um, uh, 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 that, that one issue with Indian um, NPAs, uh, non-performing assets, is, is that a lot of them are embedded NPAs. And so one gets the sense when we see this is that um, it's also a recognition problem. So when you see a jump, it's not really a jump, but it's really an issue of recognizing it. And these things could have happened in the past, so they have to be taken into account uh, when you're attributing you know, um, bank behavior and, and, and firm behavior. Anyway, going back, so the specific empirical question is, do weak firms and firms connected to weak banks respond differently from healthier firms connected to the same banks? And they use variation in pre-post-2012 data, bank data, and, and firm data to disentangle these channels. Now, there are two channels proposed here. There's a bank lending channel, okay? This is a supply side channel. And the argument basically is that, you know, public sector banks are distressed, and so the supply of credit is, is, is low. The credit offtake is low, and then this can af affect um, economic uh, activity adversely. Then there's a demand side channel, and the demand side channel basically says that there's corporate distress, so this is the other side of the twin balance sheet problem. Um, because there's corporate distress, firms don't want to invest, they have a lot of capacity utilization, they haven't filled up their capacity, so their demand for credit is low, and therefore they're not investing, and that's the reason why the economy isn't doing well. So that's, those two channels are the link between the financial sector and the real sector in the model. It's, it's that specific mechanism. And in the literature, um, these are sometimes called the borrower balance sheet channel or the, ba the bank balance sheet channel, but they all point to a financial accelerator uh, uh, in, in, in place. And the financial accelerator basically says that if a firm, for instance, or a borrower uh, firm or household experiences a negative shock to net worth, this decreases the value of their collateral and it increases the external finance premium, which leads to higher costs of borrowing, which leads to lower spending and lower activity. So it's the bank lending channel, which is the heart of the of, of financial accelerator. So what the authors are saying is this seems to be like a reasonable way to think about how credit cycles and real cycles in the Indian context can be explained. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very useful way to think, think about it. And the main result of the paper is basically, by the way, the bank lending channel operates over and above the standard effect that interest rates have, have on the economy, right? Now, <clears throat> the main result of the paper is that, uh, uh, if, I mean, there were lots of results, but let me see if I can say this, this as clearly as possible, is that firms with weak corporate balance sheets had worse outcomes throughout the sample, and this is regardless of whether they were connected to weak or strong banks. So that's one result that they get. And they also find that firms that are connected to weak banks also had work outcomes. Now, all of this kind of prima facie makes a lot of sense, um, and it fits the Indian description well. Um, the Indian uh, business sector is heavily dependent on bank credit. Um, there's a small, relatively small size of the, of the capital market that it resorts to. It's increased over the years, of course, but this has limited the diversification of Indian assets. I mean, if you look at data from 2004-05, uh, as for sources of funds for the corporate sector, the share of domestic capital market, which is debt plus equity, was only about 10.4%. Um, domestic borrowing from banks and financial institutions was much more, which was about 34.7%. The corporate bond market has grown, but the bond market is largely dominated by government bonds. Um, I don't know what the recent numbers are, but 10 years ago that constituted 90% of total bonds outstanding. Um, and, the, and, the, and the corporate bond market has grown. So, the point is that the Indian business cycle, the sector is heavily dependent on bank credit, um, and, uh, and uh, the, once again, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue is, is therefore, therefore an interesting one. Okay, so I haven't said anything substantial so far, so let me get to some, of, some, some, some comments. Um, so my first comment is kind of a nitpicking data thing, so maybe credit could be uh, uh, treated in a slightly more detailed way. There's, there's, there's a variety of ways to look at credit. You could look at credit growth, uh, which is the change in bank credit volume from one period to the next. The credit cycle could be cyclical fluctuations of bank lending over time, uh, which can facilitate the buildup of systemic risk. 
You could look at a credit output gap, which would be the percentage deviation of credit output from its long run trend. Um, or you could look at credit disturbances, which is just an exogenous a random shock. But my second comment is um, I'm wondering if there's possibly a more Schumpeterian view behind what's going on. So basically, firms face an intertemporal trade off between current production and restructuring activities that will boost future production. In other words, firms are interested in boosting production, but they also may inter be interested in R&D activities. And under certain conditions, the reallocative activity is more likely during a recession. So if in a recession it's a bad time to do production, maybe firms in recessions would actually engage in more R&D. So that could be the positive side or the silver lining of, of, of being, in a, being in a downturn, which could then you know, set in stage a, 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 a process for possibly future output growth in the future. Um, but if credit is pro-cyclical, this would mean that credit constraints are likely to be more binding during recessions. And this would suggest that productively improving activities could also be pro-cyclical pro too. So firms basically borrow to invest in R&D, and if they're hit with a downturn, the R&D suffers. So it's not as if the credit cycle and the real cycle are, 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 are separate to the extent that R&D doesn't happen. It does happen to the extent that credit constraints face firms when, when they are in recession. So there is the, the te technology does become part of the story um, um, ultimately. Third, um, I, I didn't see at least, but I'm sure this is in the paper, uh, whether there was a, a possible way through which bank capital uh, could be a, a source of, 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 of real financial li linkages um, in the paper. So suppose that a financial shock causes a reduction in bank capital, um, and the balance sheet logic requires that banks contract their assets as a multiple of its capital in order for the bank to restore its leverage ratio, um, and banks could basically uh, solve this by, by raising new capital or by reducing their lending, uh, but a bad economy may not be a good time to raise new capital. So reduced lending happens and the productive sector of the firm gets hit if, if, if it depends on, on, on bank credit to run its activities. So I didn't see a discussion of shocks to bank capital and that's another mechanism in the literature that has been proposed to uh, link the real sector with the financial sector. And then finally, um, what are the implications for uh, macroprudential policy? Um, I guess one question that arises is, is whether discretionary interventions like the Reserve Bank of India has undertaken in terms of its asset quality review uh, is more effective than automatic stabilizers like tightening capital markets, limiting credit expansion, uh, liquidity uh, and leverage ratios and so on, controlling the degree of majority transformation. Um, and finally, I'll just end by saying a few things. Uh, public sector banks uh, have more NPAs and big borrowers are causing a large part of the problem. And I'm wondering if, if the analysis has control for that. And, and, and also, NBFC lending has increased. So if credit and real cycles are highly correlated, I mean, so one of the numbers that a banker threw out to me was that if banks lend 100 rupees today, NBFPs lend about 74. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that's uh, also a mechanism through which risk can be spread. Uh, between the, the financial sector and the real sector. Thank you. Do you want to comment on this now or take them all at the end? Yeah, maybe I can take some questions. No, and yeah, okay. So I think what Viral would like is to take a few questions and then he'll give a response to all of them. So uh, I see Rakesh Mohan. Uh, I've got your hands and let's have Rakesh first. We'll take about three questions and then ask him to respond and have a second round maybe. Uh, three qu quick questions. One, uh, why, did questions. You, uh, wh wh why did you not take the longer business cycle that is the boom really from 2002, 2003 or thereabouts to 2010 or thereabouts? Um, then you actually have a longer boom and a shorter downturn. So I'm very surprised that you started a boom in 2009, 10. Second, um, in the credit to uh, the, the, the uh, uh, firms, the, the, the non-financial firms, uh, have you taken account of the foreign borrowing? Because ECB and other borrowing increased a fair amount, uh, I think between 2006, so if I remember correctly, to 2009-10, or something of that order. But uh, that, that, would also, that was sort of unconnected to Indian banking, so that would be interesting to look at. And third, why did not distinguish within public sector banks some better ones and some less good ones. 
rather than shoving them all into the weak bank basket. <laughs> okay, that's uh, Ratna. Thanks, Monte. Uh, you want to stand up? It'll be easier oh. for them to follow. <laughs> sure. uh, so I, I found your results uh, very interesting, uh, but I have a different interpretation of your results. I mean, you said uh, what you find is that it's both. It's the bank lending channel as well as the corporate distress. I really think from your own results, the story is simply the bank lending channel. Why do I say that? Um, it's because what is clear to me is that uh, the, the banks, uh, the weaker banks are lending to these corporates. They don't have to. Uh, there must be something else that's going on that's missing. And I'll mention in a second what that is. Uh, so to me, the story is that the supervisors were not doing a good job in, uh, in, um, in their on-site supervision of these banks. Um, that's my, one of my policy uh, conclusions. Uh, the second one is uh, the issue is not about corporate di distress. I mean, no bank should lend them. So they must be lending them. Uh, if they are private banks, it's because they assume an implicit guarantee. And that's why they continue to lend to weak corporates. Or if they are public banks, they are not maximizing profits. So to me, the fundamental problem is really about uh, the weak banks because of legacy assets. And if I can just add, I was just having a discussion with uh, uh, Mr. Bhalla here. Where is he? He's sitting right here. And the first thing he asked me is, did, you know, uh, did the RBI do the right thing on the monetary policy side? And I said, absolutely, because uh, the fundamental problem of credit not expanding is the bad loans which are on the balance sheet of the banks. Uh, that will go a lot. Cleaning that up is going to get credit flowing much more than just uh, uh, you know reducing interest rates by a few percentage points. Thank. <coughs> okay, I think we said one more question. So uh, the gentleman here, I come come to you in a second. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Acharya, the way you were talking about strong bank and weak bank, do you think this merger of bank will make a strong bank? to resolve all types of problems pending with this banking system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, Vera. So uh, I think I'll try and stick to what I presented and not comment on policy, if, if that's all right. Um, so uh, I, I think, uh, le let me just briefly respond to some of the questions that uh, Chetan raised. Uh, thanks, uh, Chetan. Sorry I couldn't give you a decent draft or anything of anything. Um, yeah, yeah, I think this uh, firm reallocation point is is, is quite interesting. And uh, there's a, one of my students, uh, MBA students, who did her PhD at Berkeley and is now at CAFREL, which is the research arm uh, set up by RBI in uh, last uh, seven, eight years, uh, Nirupama Kulkarni. She has an interesting study of the restructurings that took place in India once the Sarfezi Act was uh, implemented in 2002. And what she finds is, and maybe this connects uh, at least a little bit to the 2002-03 question that uh, R uh, Rakesh Mohan asked, which is that uh, what she found is that in that phase, actually right once the Sarfezi Act was implemented, actually the banks did actually use the Sarfezi Act to fix the firms. They most of the times exercise their new secured creditor rights. And what that did was it actually did sort of the Schumpeterian reallocation within the sector. And what she documents is that once the weaker firms were basically more or less put into liquidation by banks because they could actually this time exercise their rights outside of the courts through Sarfezi, the healthier firms in the affected sectors actually recovered very well because the capacity utilization in the sectors now became healthier, their pricing power came back, they were willing to invest, they were more profitable and so on. Uh, and uh, this is my key concern and I, uh, I stressed this in some of the comments yesterday that the 
the capacity utilization in many of the sectors right now is, is, is very low. And what should ideally happen is that the weak firms, the weakest of the firms here who don't have any net worth or EBITDA or operating margins that are healthy enough should really be getting weeded out of these sectors. And it's not taking place. And so it, I think that's through uh, uh, equilibrium effects, I think it's actually depressing a lot of economic activity. Um, uh, we, I, I didn't get a chance to show you any results on the finance, financial side, but when we look at leverage, we do pick up everything uh, that the firms are using to borrow, though we didn't dig down into specifically into NBFC finance or corporate bonds or uh, external commercial borrowings. Now, uh, Ben Bernanke and Mark Gertler, who started this financial accelerator research, uh, one of the things they used to see whether there is actually uh, demand in the economy as a whole, that it's not that the real sector is not willing to grow. Uh, their proxy for that was actually the issuance of corporate bonds. Uh, that, you know, if there are firms out there in the economy who, when banks are not providing credit, are substituting away from banks into non-bank finance, it's a sign that there is actually shoots of growth uh, taking place in the economy. Uh, and I think in a way, we are seeing that in our economy as well, actually. The reliance on bank finance as a whole has come down. I think various forms of corporate finance access has got boosted. In fact, sometimes when I try to lift my spirits when I have been staring at stressed assets numbers <laughs> is I immediately start start looking at the growth of corporate bond market. Uh, and it uh, you, you feel that, okay, that's been one good unintended consequence of the malaise that uh, the banks are going through right now. Uh, we could separate different public sector banks. Unfortunately, that <laughs> it would be, uh, the numbers are just very large for most of them. So I think the separation between private banks and public sector banks is a much better variation to exploit econometrically than something within uh, the public sector banks. Uh, uh, I think I broadly agree with you, Ratna, that um, we, so you know, I, I didn't stress too much uh, that actually the weaker firms, the firms that were connected to the weakest banks did actually ride the boom a lot stronger. They were actually the faster growing firms and then they just had a hard landing. Now, when we do that counterfactual exercise, we are not, uh, allowing for this at all, that maybe some of the employment growth that took place or CapEx growth that took place during 2009 to 12, maybe it wasn't that sustainable. Uh, our exercise is all saying, okay, we're going to take whatever happened before as normal and whatever's happening afterwards as a shock. But clearly this is not right. I think what you might have wanted is a more steady uh, CapEx growth over the cycle rather than like a huge boom and then a bust. But the econometrics is not really kind of, you need some structural model uh, to get at things like that. Um, uh, the, the last point uh, that uh, I, I think Chetan raised this point as to whether bank capital is playing a role, I think it absolutely is. Uh, so in our monetary policy report that RBI put out in April, we had some analysis where we looked at stressed assets relative to your capitalization. Uh, I find that bank capitalization by itself is never a great variable because for most of the times, banks manage to look well capitalized on regulatory capital standards. I think the real stress has to be measured in some other way <laughs> on like whatever you are using to measure them is not going to pick up. Maybe it's a version of the Goodhart, Charles Goodhart law that whatever you are using to measure something because they can control it, it's not going to look to be the right measure. You have to look at some other way through which the stress is going to show up. But stressed assets relative to bank capital actually does uh, seem to also give a very similar picture. So in the monetary policy report, we didn't have as granular analysis, but we were showing that banks that are stressed are actually charging very high net interest margins. But of course, because of that, the quantity of credit is compressing because they are asking for very high returns on the new loans that they are making out there. So that had results that were more in the direction of a credit crunch because we were looking at uh, Bank, bank margins, bank lending quantities, rather than exploiting what's happening to the corporate finance of the firms that are getting affected. Uh, 
Uh, one last point, uh, I haven't analyzed evergreening, etc., in the Indian context, but uh, one reason why I haven't been a big fan of using monetary policy to deal with these kinds of problems, and uh, in, in, I have commented on this publicly in my research in other settings, uh, uh, notably Europe, where I studied this, is because I find that it actually uh, backfires. Uh, that you give banks cheap credit and uh, what they do is that the hurdle rate for evergreening comes down. And that's what they really want to do at that point. And so you actually slow down the cleansing of the sector that I was just talking about. Now, clearly, uh, monetary policy will also have the salubrious effect because some demand would have come down through knock-on effects from sectors and firms connected to the slowing down firms and sectors. But I think what I'm just trying to say is that it becomes a blunt instrument. You could have unintended consequences taking place here. But uh, I think in my sense is that from, like I, I had this example in my paper that I like a lot, um, uh, so United Colors of Benetton, you know, it's there on all Indian airports. <laughs> They're selling clothes. Uh, they had, they were borrowing in 2013 from Italian banks at cheaper rates. So uh, they were loss making. Uh, their margins were heavily eroded. Uh, their interest coverage ratio was in fact less than one. Uh, and they got financing from Italian banks in 2013 and 14 at a cheaper cost than AAA rated German corporation. And basically, they got a three year loan. So essentially, the problem got postponed from 2013 to 2016. And then, of course, the problems resurfaced because you didn't really fix the firm, you just prolonged the maturity of these things. Uh, but uh, I think what happened is that. And, and I think it, it also shows that it's important to understand the microeconomics of what's going on. Because if you looked at what happened after the liquidity injections that took place in, in 2012 and 13 in Europe, actually immediately credit picked up. The macro numbers show that banks actually provided more credit. They created new credit with the liquidity that was injected. But when you look at the microeconomics of what happened, it was actually firms like United Colors of Benetton that were getting rollover of their existing credit. And so that credit expansion didn't happen for the right firms or for the right sectors of the economy. And so you were zombie banks were basically extending the lives of zombie firms. Um, so anyway, yeah. Thank you very much, <coughs> Viral. I think, do we have, uh, Rajat, uh, how much time do we have? How much what? One more round of three questions? Okay, yeah. Sujit, since you've been named on the floor, <laughs> you have to be given precedence. <laughs> uh, Chetan, I think you have to take, answer this question. <laughs> no, my question has to has to do with the beginning of your uh, talk, yeah. uh, which is on data analytics and use of data, um, and something that I'm uh, very sympathetic towards and uh, believe it, it should be done. So I want to encourage that trend. So my question is this, that what you have noted um, is that the inflation forecasts of the RBI have been way out of line. And and they've recognized this by saying that, listen, we are changing it. So my question is this, that if you had all the data in the world, would you, do you think that the RBI would have been able to make better forecasts of the inflation data? So was it the lack of data that <coughs> prevented uh, the RBI from making accurate forecasts? Uh, mind you, very many uh, private analysts uh, were able to make accurate forecasts during the same uncertain period that we've gone through. So what do you think led to uh, the misuse of data analytics, if you will, at the RBI? Okay, thanks, uh, Surjit. Uh, next question, yes? Okay, 
I really liked your paper, sir. I'm Rohan. I'm a student at University College London. I think your definition of weak banks goes... Can't be heard. I think your definition of weak banks goes beyond the challenges that self-reporting of NPAs present. Uh, my question is, sir, in terms of differentiating between weak and strong firms, how did you address the challenge of cross-sorting? Was there any randomization used or prevent city score matching approach used to make sure that it wasn't just the weak firms going for the weaker banks? Okay, thank you. Yeah, the lady of the corner. Uh, you see, my point is, uh, I've got two points. One relates to, uh, we did a study uh, covering the same data, prowess data for a number of farms. And what we found is that the use of the money, use of the credit, which the firms are getting from banks, well, the use of it is very peculiar because it's not just peculiar, you know, it runs uh, in the direction of profit because uh, at least 30% of the funds which the, which the company can invest is directed towards financial securities. Now, given that, uh, what happens is that, I mean, I, I don't see, you know, why there should be much of a relation between bank credit and employment and sales when a large part of the, a chunk of that money is going in the direction of financial securities. Okay, it goes to stock markets and various other things. The second point is very briefly the following, that uh, you know in the, in the West, in advanced countries, there is this big debate going on, the growth profit trade-off uh, between, uh, between the shareholder interest and the owners of farms. Now in India also, I think, that has come up, that has surfaced, in the sense that when the, uh, when the farms are borrowing money from banks, much of it is going to meet the current liabilities, which means, you know, on, in the uh, right-hand side, they borrow money, and in the left-hand side, they meet the liabilities, current liabilities, which is another name of Ponzi. So I thought that... Thanks. Yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I think maybe I can take those. and Let me start uh, in the reverse sequence. Uh, it'll be easier. <laughs> uh, so... Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think I agree, uh, Sunanda, that um, I, I think this is what the United uh, Colors of Benetton example that I gave from Italy, where I was able to look at micro loan level data, that was exactly that. You got a new loan, and effectively you actually, a set of weak banks paid off the broader set of consortium banks. In fact, what you find there is very, even more interesting, and it kind of shows what you can do with better data. You find that healthy banks did not give the rollover of credit to, the, to United Colors of Benetton. It's the weak banks that gave it because they didn't want to actually cut their losses. They paid off the healthy bank, which then it goes and lends to healthier firms in the economy. But the weak banks continue this rollover business, ending up sometimes with even larger amounts of loans, but they're just coming three years down the road. And when you roll over a loan, it's, not being, it's, not, it's being paid. So you don't have to record, you don't have to change the asset classification. It's not a non-performing asset. You don't have to start provisioning for it. You look good on your capi regulatory capital standards and so on. I haven't exploited the investments in financial securities, but I think that's an interesting thought, which is whether instead of doing real activity, you are getting this credit and you just take punts and uh, do something else. Uh, on weak firm definition, um, uh, I think, it, uh, one has to basically just play around with these things a little bit. Unfortunately, you know, they don't come with a label uh, saying I'm a weak firm <laughs> in the data set. So we have to be a little creative and just, I, I think the way I see it is one just wants to be sure that some one specific choice you made is not sort of driving all your analysis. But um, ideally one wants some truly exogenous shock like an oil price shock or something like that, you know, and maybe some firms, uh, some sectors get hit by that, but not others. Or uh, one thing that some people in research have exploited is um, you could have firms that are in your country, but also in another country, and then their foreign operation gets hit because of an exogenous shock. And then that firm becomes a weaker firm as a whole because the parent is not able to support the local activities as well. So people have tried to look at these kinds of shocks, 
uh, we were not as uh, enterprising in our in inquiry here. Uh, I think on inflation forecast, I'll, I'll just talk more generally, I think, as to what I think would help as a whole for the system. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, uh, I appreciate your observations and criticisms. Um, um, uh, is that um, my sense is that it's, it's easy to predict in data what's likely to repeat itself. I, I think almost by definition uh, that, you know, you can't build a model necessarily of things that are completely non-stationary or one-off uh, sort of things. Uh, and uh, sometimes when uh, markets are stable and operating for over a period of time, uh, in subject to rules, regulations, conditions that are steady, I think the data that would come out of that may actually be amenable to this sort of modeling, statistical modeling or analysis. But then there are times when, uh, you know, the data are just non-stationary. And uh, unfortunately, at that point, uh, the kind of micro data that I'm talking about is really essential uh, to understand on the ground what's really happening. Uh, but it kind of raises challenges because while it's good to uh, attribute everything to one new thing that's happening in the economy, uh, it, it unfortunately makes the job of research and projections very hard because uh, it could be that there are stationary forces at work also in data. And so that separation of what part of data is a steady signal uh, what part of data is an unusual noise, that may be a new normal, but you're not going to know that for a while. And uh, without getting into too much details, my sense is this is the challenge one is facing on important parts of inflation that are sh behaving differently than they have historically. Uh, and let me just say we are trying to grapple with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Viral and Chetan. Um, you know, I think my, the organizers have said that we should now stop. So allow me to apologize to all the people whom I wasn't able to take uh, questions from. But I think you'll all agree that we've had a very interesting and very informative and very educative session. So join me in thanking Viral and Chetan for giving us such a good evening. Thank you very much. I'm sure all of you are very tired after this very rich and stimulating day. So you're all invited for dinner. Please stay and have dinner with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>